to then open the session. Um, it is my great, great pleasure to welcome everybody here from far and from close by to this um, virtual book launch that we organized in the Netherlands Research School of Gender Studies for uh, today. Uh, my name is Katrin Thiele. I'm an associate professor in the Graduate Gender Program and also part of the Netherlands Research School of Gender Studies here in the Netherlands. And it's my great pleasure today to um, lead you through the program that we have wonderfully put together for you. This event is organized by the Netherlands Research School of Gender, uh, Gender Studies, which is also hosted at Utrecht University here. And I would like to thank especially also Trude Orschrott and Florin Keistra uh, from the NOCH office for helping to organize this event. Of course, it is not totally ideal to do a book launch virtually. Usually a book launch lives of meeting the author, being there in real life, touching the books, maybe looking into it, maybe purchasing one, of, one copy. And that is of course for the very many, uh, for the very, uh, not very many, but for a very, very well-known reason at this moment, not possible. But it is maybe a nice uh, uh, consequence of uh, the situation that we are all in around the globe at this moment, that our virtual book launch can maybe reach out to many more corners all around the globe uh, in different contexts can be joined and thus once more welcome to everybody who joins in today from far away or from close by. Um, we will celebrate today, we want to celebrate today um, three book publications that in this heavy and very strenuous year for many of us um, have nonetheless um, seen the day of light. And we wanted to really celebrate and mark this before here in the Netherlands, at least, the academic year slowly comes to an end. And this is what will come today um, in the next one and a half hours that we have, uh, that we have together. We chose the webinar option. Maybe, maybe that is important for everybody to, to hear who is here. Um, we chose the webinar option because it's then easier to share the event to a broader public. But that means, dear audience out there, that your participation that is very much wished for and your contributions cannot be um, uh, transmitted in a verbal oral form, but will have to be done so by um, in, in written form. And down at the, at, the, at, the, at the bar down there, you'll see a Q&A button. And please feel free and do not be shy during the presentations that we hear write down your questions to the author or questions that you would like to have maybe uh, uh, hear an answer from one of the authors or from one of the respondents. Um, it would be great to have in that sense interaction with each other. Before we get to the first book, let me also say that um, qua format, we would like to spend um, for each of the book around the same time and we will hear a short introduction or some words to start with by the authors first. I think also now with, we just talked about this also with the first book, we will do this. I'll tell you in a second who is, how we do this all. Um, then afterwards, it was wonderful to have respondents, which the authors have invited um, to speak about the books. And maybe they will end with some questions. So there will be a short in, um, conversation also between author and respondents. And then we hope we have some questions from the audience, from all of you, to also that also can be responded and then we move on to the next and hopefully at the end of the session we also have time to speak with each other especially also the um, authors and respondents the people here on the panel. Uh, Florine if you would now I think um, can take down maybe the the slide so that we are all yes thank you very much um, because I would like to start we do it in according to the alphabetical order as we also announced the books so we will start with um, Rosemary Balcom's book, Revolts in Cultural Critique. And before I hand over the word to Rosemary and to her respondents, I would like to tell you a little bit. I would also like to introduce them. So Rosemary Balcom, as many of you here know, of course, holds the chair of Art, Culture and Diversity at Utrecht University. She's the director of the Graduate Gender Program here at Utrecht University. And she's also the director of the Netherlands Research School of Gender Studies. Well, and she also that is part of the directing team of a hub on gender and diversity here, here at UU and uh, the initiator of the online museum of equality and difference um, that is called Mood. Mood, sorry, Mood. Mm -hmm. um, 
All of these activities I tell you in institutional leadership functions shape, of course, the writing of Rosemary very much and for a long time. And this writing and her research is very much focused on transformational powers of cultural critique and of the arts. And it's now a great pleasure to have her here today with us with her most recent book publications, as I said, Revolts in Cultural Critique, just fresh from the press, uh, from Roman and Littlefield. And if I may uh, make a little bit of self-promotion, it's uh, published in a book series where I am co-editor with two other colleagues on uh, the book series at RLI is called New Critical Humanities. And I'm saying this not in order to self-promote, but I'm saying this because maybe out there, people think about they might have a manuscript somewhere ready or latently possible, please approach um, us, approach me if you would like to um, know something about this book series, which now I can also, um, in a second, Rosemary will show the book, of course, that's at least something we can do virtually. After Rosemary will have introduced the book a little bit by herself, a respondent, as I said, will take the word, and it's a great pleasure here to welcome Tamara Schäfer to the, to the panel. Tammy is a senior professor and head of department of women's and gender studies at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. And it's wonderful to see you here. And that's exactly so wonderful that we are doing this virtually because that way it is much easier to have you here. And yours and Rosemary's cooperations and collaboration is longstanding and over many, many years and also really connected to the work that um, is happening in the book that Rosemary has written. And I think right now you're also cooperating in one of your um, and, uh, in one, and one research project and an Andrew Mellon Foundation project on new imaginaries for an intersectional critical humanities project on gender and sexual justice. All of that shows already, I think, that your works speak very well with each other, so we couldn't have wished for more that you now in conversation with each other here. And now I would like to hand over to Rosemary, whom I will spotlight also so that you see her in, um, in larger screen and um, Let's enjoy the ride. Hello, everybody. Great to have you all together on the screen. Uh, I won't dive too much into my desire to have you all in real life around me and to look you into the eyes, but it is like what it is. And indeed, it's a very nice um, collateral pleasure, so to speak, that we can have Tammy here. And indeed, Tammy and I have worked uh, together uh, for a long time, and she has been a great inspiration for a lot, which is being thought about in this book, which she will dive into um, uh, in a few minutes when she will give her, yeah, the book is here. Um, and I thought as by means of an introduction to the book, I may be best uh, author plagiarize myself and read an incident or an, an, something which I uh, found very telling and which I started the book with. So I, and uh, where, which is also sort of a mise en abime to use uh, the term for the entire uh, book. Sort of an, I give you sort of an image while speaking. While working on the manuscript for this book, I attended a concert by the Turkish composer and pianist Fasol Say in Amsterdam, during which I thought, this is what revolt sounds like. Here, a musical event is unfolding which resists univocal appropriation. Here, a joint acoustic experience intervenes in the relationship between people and the world that surrounds them. Say performed a work he composed in 2014, the Piano Sonata Opus 52, titled Gacy Park II, to an ethnically and generationally very diverse audience. The sonata is part of a trilogy dedicated to the events that took place in the spring of 2013. A lot of you might remember how millions of demonstrators protested in Gacy Park and at Taksim Square against the materialist and environmentally destructive plans of the incumbent government, which had decided that the park, once one of Istanbul's last remaining green spaces, should make way for a shopping mall. After an exceptionally violent intervention by the police, the conflict acquired the appearance of a civil war, 
one with many innocent victims and among them a 14 year old boy named Birkin Elvin. Say's Gacy Sonata consists of four parts. One, nights of resistance on the streets of Istanbul. Two, the silence of the glass cloud. Three, on the killing of the innocent child Birkin Elvin. And four, hope is always in our hearts. These four teams seemed to be performed simultaneously and the performance came across as a single piece with no clear delineation between the parts, resulting in an overwhelming musical experience. Say did everything one can do with a piano. He played the keys, experimented with the hierarchy between the right hand and the left hand. He strummed the strings in the cast iron frame with his fingers. He tapped on the resonance box box and worked the pedal, stamped his feet and shifted with the greatest ease between tonality and atonality and between European and Oriental musical styles. Thus, composer and performer coincided. A centuries old musical instrument confronted several centuries, uh, several uh, centuries old musical traditions with the actuality of a country in transition aesthetics paired with political awareness, dismay and resistance, and thus aesthetics, ethics and politics became inextricably entangled. Via the act of jointly listening to a piece of contemporary music, a blend of paradoxical forces and emotions was set in motion. After the concert, the shared experience led to intense conversations, not only between friends, but also between complete strangers. A diverse audience really met one another and exchanged their experiences and their insights, searching for words with which to articulate what it was exactly that they had heard and what the implications might be for the musical practice of a country in transition and for the articulation of what it means to exist in a globalized world. It is my hope that exactly this, the desire to discuss what aesthetics and politics when enacted jointly can set in motion, is a challenge that readers of revolts in cultural critique also feel invited to take up. Tommy, the floor is yours. Hi everybody, thanks so much. It's really an honor to be a part of this celebration and it's especially significant to me, um, given our particular histories that have been outlined, to engage with Rosemary's new book. So firstly, many congratulations to the Netherlands Research School of Gender Studies on three what look like amazing books and a huge congrats Rosemary for this wonderful contribution to global transdisciplinary post-colonial feminist scholarship. Revolts in Cultural Critique is a powerful bringing together of many pieces of your past and your current work. And in particular, your guidance in thinking through and with art and politics. You've just read so beautifully your hope that the desire to discuss what aesthetics and politics when enacted jointly can set into motion is a challenge that readers of Revolts also feel invited to take up. Appreciation for this invitation. And I can certainly report that as one of your readers, a reader who simply could not put your book down, so entranced was I in the rich analyses of the various artworks and the lively narrative unfolding like an engaging novel. I certainly took up the challenge and am ever more inspired in the project of appreciating art for the work it can do in and with justice efforts and political change. The book indeed instills renewed affirmation of how productive it is for critical feminist scholars to think with and collaborate with artistic projects in our scholarship. In thanking you for your book, Rosemary, I need to stretch this as you know I would to a larger thank you. The early connections with Rosemary and other Utrecht University's feminist scholars, I don't want to mention too many names in case I leave some out, were really important for our own growth 
as the site of feminist scholarship in Cape Town, South Africa. We have a long story together and it spans most or even more of the time frame of this book's engagements with South African artworks. When I personally came into women's and gender studies in 1990, Rosemary and colleagues were already working with feminist and anti-apartheid activists and scholars at the University of the Western Cape where I still am and elsewhere in South Africa. Over the years, we had a range of collaborations involving postgraduate students and early career scholars that not only built feminist researchers, but contributed to the strengthening and the building of our unit. From a small postgraduate program, we are now a stable department with permanent academic staff and a full offering of programs. And this feels very founded in the kind of ongoing support, mentorship and collegiality that we had as individual feminist scholars, but also in our programs from scholars like Rosemary and others at Utrecht University. So returning to revolts, just a few thoughts before opening the dialogue, which was our wish. Personally, I'm really pleased to have the book in the material form, although I've got it virtually, especially as I've already been citing it in press and in Dutch, and it speaks so well to my own current work as, as Katrin alluded to in the beginning. More importantly though, the book is such a wonderful resource for many of us who are dialoguing across art, activism and the academy, and particularly within decolonial feminist efforts. Although I know Rosemary has been working in this area for a very long time, it feels particularly opportune for the book to emerge at this moment in South African context, and particularly since the book is thinking with and through many South African artworks from literature to music to performance to visual art. As Rosemary argues, politics must employ different registers, use the power of the imagination and inventiveness, and should thus look towards the possible worlds that are opened by art. Right now in South Africa, political activists and particularly young decolonial feminist and queer activists and artists are indeed deploying imagination and creativity to shift to disrupt the race, class, and gendered inequalities and violences that still characterize our local landscape and lived experiences. Also in our ongoing efforts in the post-apartheid to transform the university and reconceptualize scholarship that continues to be shaped by colonial and patriarchal logics, emphasis has been on dialogues and collaborations across disciplines and modalities, particularly with artistic and activist knowledges. It is also then especially encouraging and noteworthy that the book is written so beautifully and so accessibly through multiple registers, including the visual. I almost wish there were direct links in the text to the music and the performances too. Embedded in sophisticated, wide ranging thinking, as well as in detailed understanding of relevant global and local context, the book is itself a kind of artwork. And we are engaged as readers, inspired and moved at intersecting affective, embodied and intellectual levels. Rosemary reads different artworks with a dazzling fluidity, reading also these artworks through each other to movingly weave her arguments. For example, in chapter five, we're taken through a poignant reading of the artwork of Judith Mason, which speaks to the devastating murder of Pilla Ndwandwe and Mkuntawesi's way operative read through the works of poet and author Anki Kroch, writing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and read further through artist Wim Boerter's recycled ironworks, and with Nandi Pandwandwe's cowhide installations, which all speak with and through each other towards what Rosemary describes as the poetics of recycling, which underlines the fact that the articulation and or the memory of trauma is not a linear process, but a cycle that has to be reiterated time and again. Reading such artwork through each other with the particular conceptual lenses applied, we are able, as Rosemary articulates this so clearly, to visualize a new collective skin that has to encompass a myriad different, albeit sometimes conflicting histories. Transition and reconciliation thus become a rhythm that however slowly, both consciously and unconsciously, inscribes itself ever more securely into the cultural memory of post-colonial, post-apartheid society. Finally, I also need to share that reading your book and your analytical work from the perspective of a local South African born and bred, 
I was bowled over by your deep understanding, Rosemary, of the material and discursive histories of this country and its past and contemporary challenges. I really valued that detailed description of your experience as a speaker on the panel in Durban in 1999, just a few years after the new democracy. The sense of your embeddedness from the early post-apartheid South Africa that has been going on for two to three decades or more now of your personal and scholarly life continues to out the book as a strong undercurrent. This is indeed an impressive achievement to be so familiar to be so familiar with knowledges that are not in the bladder, sat Jonathan Jensen. I also noticed how well you located your analyses in the nuanced shifts of the changing political landscape of South Africa from the immediate post-apartheid TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission times to the current decolonial term. There was little indication, no telling slips in the narrative as there so often is when scholars from different geopolitical contexts conduct research in a context that they do not reside in. On the other hand, your situatedness in a different context also opened up fruitful alternative readings that perhaps would be different from and contribute to more local readings, as also the opposite is true. And this is one of the aspects of your engagement that I really appreciate how you value and engage with local and global Southern thinking in general on, in this project and in your dealings in general. This is also evident in, in your interpersonal engagements. Myself and other colleagues in South Africa have always remarked and welcomed your non-patronizing ethical and respectful engagement. That has unfortunately not characterized many of our other collaborative relationships as scholars in the global North. Perhaps this is why our collaborations and friendships have sustained for so long. So apologies, everybody, for that very long narrative, especially as we are here to hear the author. Um, so may I ask a set of interrelated questions to open up space, Rosemary, for you to speak a bit more about your book, if we hopefully have some time. Um, and, and in particular, questions that ask in relation to its value for current challenging contexts that we find ourselves in locally and globally and trans and, and locally. So Rosemary, you make a strong argument about the value of arts as a poetics of recycling and emphasize the way art stirs up the heart, inspires a working through of the past towards revolt, not a pro total break with the past, but a working through towards alternative imaginaries for the present and future. This powerful framing of the poetics of recycling is embroidered through much of your work in revolts and is really key, I think, to your thesis on revolt and change. So I would love to, and I'm sure others would love to hear you speak more about this and your related emphasis on testimony and how it has to be deployed in current context. Um, you, so, so how you talk about the importance of collective testimonies to deal with heritages that are traumatic or whatever, to make something new, to move on. And you put this so beautifully, it brings me to a question about how do we go about such testimonies collectively when histories of colonization and presence of global capital continue to shape our current world, even more starkly so in COVID-19 times, which further bolsters nation state boundariness, restricting movement of people and rationalizing exclusionary practices. How do we engage a collective project across geopolitical boundaries? And are there some artistic contributions in this respect that you could share? And, and just to add to that, because I'm giving all my questions together, if that's okay, or should, should I stop there? Given time, okay. And one of the strong political calls that are threaded throughout your book, which you introduced right in the beginning with your poignant reading of Faisal Say's performance, is to resist univocal appropriation, and that art is one powerful medium for doing this. Um, what are current imperatives globally um, in this respect, in the context of pandemic isolation and nation state boundariness, as well as current violences such as Israeli attacks on Palestinians, not to mention climate change and increasing realizations of the damages of the Anthropocene on the planet, planet and, and more than human species. And have you been engaging with any art in this respect that destabilizes and disrupts univocal thinking in any particular looming challenge in current times and that seeks to make a difference. And then finally, and this links to both those questions which link to each other, having completed this, this wonderful book, which brings together so much of your work and thinking over many years, that almost traces the genealogy of your, your life work in some ways, dare I ask, 
So where to now? Where is your own creative energy and inspiration? So clearly unstoppable and flourishing, taking you in your scholarship. Thank, thank you for the time. Over to you, Rosemary. <laughs> Yes, um, please, Rosemary, uh, maybe you want to collect yourself for the wonderful questions. Thank you so much, Tammy, for this lovely response. And we heard, heard already a lot what you thought about the book and what's happening. So, Rosemary, I give it to you. Yeah, this is uh, meeting uh, the reader, which is actually much more interesting than meeting uh, the author, to be honest. Yeah, it's so lovely to, to have a good reader. If you only have one reader like Tammy, I can tell the others that's enough. So uh, <laughs> I'm totally happy with your, with your feedback. And of course, I can only uh, start to give an answer because there are all of these things. Um, um, yeah, th this is, is, is enough to talk about uh, for days, which we uh, obviously, uh, of course, will do also. But indeed, it's, it's, it's true that my work um, indeed can be summarized as an attempt to design a poetics of recycling. That is basically the method which I try to develop uh, in, in the book. And this, this uh, poetics of recycling is now very much taken up, uh, taken up as, as an act of repair. The notion of repair is also what currently is central to an uh, exhibition in Bach with Kader Atiyah and I, I found a lot of resonances with his concept of repair and uh, my idea of the poetics of uh, recycling and we'll be in touch about that at another moment. Um, but in, in the case of the book and also in, in, in his work and in the decolonial use of uh, the, the concept of repair, the, this reparation um, has indeed everything to do with the legacies of um, patriarchy, colonialism and capitalism, a legacy to which we have to return to, um, which I constantly try to demonstrate in the book, and which is also a legacy which inevitably reveals how patriarchy, colonialism and capitalism have exhausted our bodies, our psyches, as well as the planet and our uh, soil. But um, the histories of these legacies also preserve uh, the, the seeds of resistance. And that's where I'm, of course, particularly interested in the seeds of survival, of creativity and of struggles, which might teach us how to regain the things that have been nurturing us, as um, Munir Fashet recently put it in a, in a conference or to speak with Françoise Fergier and Audrey Lord, we cannot dismantle the man master's house uh, with the master's tools. So our feminist decolonial answer to the planetary exhaustion will have to be directed by the analysis of how the master's house, so how the architecture of, of uh, rationality, individualism and competition has produced isolation, erasure and exhaustion. And what all the decolonial and feminist artists, uh, which I stage in the book, perform is the right to ask the other question, the right to be confused, the right to listen to a plethora of contradicting stories, the right to build communities and to contemplate the engineerings of relationality as a counter movement to the hegemonic culture of individualism, meritocracy, and, and rationality, and to counteract the appetite for appropriation of meaning and goods. Um, that's also what I tried to illustrate with the, indeed the, the, the fossil say um, uh, anecdote. And indeed, as you uh, aptly uh, notice, um, as many artists nowadays demonstrate, but especially also the artists in my book, but they are definitely part of a global movement. Um, what, what engaged artists nowadays uh, demonstrate is that you do need imagination. You need to reshuffle matter and form to interpret the press processes in which we are all implicated. And um, we need the imagination to rebend the exhaustion, the exclusion, and the isolation through building new coalitions. 
So the example of artists indeed, which you also mentioned, uh, making dresses for the mistreated and humiliated body of freedom fighter Pila uh, Nuantve, for example, which the cover image of the book also is referring to, um, created an affective collective response to a history which is indeed simultaneously characterized by ultimate uh, victimhood, um, but also by subversive heroism. So in the end, what I hope to, demonst to demonstrate in the book, but also in your asking, what am I going to do now, now that the book is done? The first answer is nothing. And the second answer is, <laughs> um, yeah, that it's only the beginning, of course, of a, of a, of a series of other practices which need further uh, in, in uh, investigation. Because um, in the end, art as a practice of working through is a means to affirm the strength of those who were wounded uh, by history. So it is a means to repair broken communities without, of course, erasing the scars. And it is a means to allow everybody to embody the beginning of new episodes in an ongoing uh, story. Um, as for the examples you were you were asking for for new examples of artists who are doing that, trying to, to escape binaries and to, to create new coalitions. Um, in the Netherlands, for example, there's an interesting Dutch composer, Marijn Twaalfhoven, who uh, composes music to be played by two divided communities. Uh, for example, the Palestinians and the, and the Israelis. And he, he also traveled through the world uh, and, and played the, his, his compositions at both sides of all those walls with different um, uh, groups of uh, musicians from the local uh, communities. And that these are very, very moving and interesting um, and beautiful projects. Or, um, for example, the Indonesian artist Arachmaniani, where uh, one of our uh, PhD students uh, is writing about in her soon to be defended PhD thesis, Deirdre Donoghue. She writes about the, the uh, Arachmaniani's flag project, and Arachmaniani will be one of our guests in, in our mood project also. Um, what she is doing is she is visiting local communities, uh, talking with the members of these communities and designing significant words in, in all different kinds of languages on uh, uh, suing different kinds of words on colorful flags and then jointly perform a choreography with the communities globally all over the world. And there is a whole chain of um, visual proof of these kind of communities. So your question, how to create or how to connect globally, I think that doing, uh, using the same kind of method or using the imagination as, as a musician or as a visual artist or a performance artist and do it at different spaces in the world um, creates a, 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 yeah, a, a very, very powerful uh, community. And she herself, Arachmaniani, is someone who is uh, under threat all the time because of what she's doing. For herself, she is creating also a community who, who, which will hold her in, in times of, um, of, of danger, so to speak. So um, these kind of collective art projects are criticizing the individual genius of the artist as well as the colonization of aesthetics by a happy few without uh, playing down the role of the imagination because there's, there's a lot of beauty in these, um, um, in these projects. Uh, and there are more, but maybe for, for the sake of time, I need to, um, to wrap up. But the, the right to work through the past, the right to remember, that is what Rolando Vasquez in the same conference where I was re referring to by, uh, with Munir, um, he, what, what he said, he, puts, uh, he, he translated remember as something which is membering back. So that which has been dismembered, repairing that which has been dismembered. So to remember who we are uh, as relational beings, trying to escape the binary of the oppressor and the oppressed, a binary which denies the agency of the subaltern, I try to uh, argue in my book. 
um, uh, uh, and also that, that will prevent us from learning from different struggles around the world, that will continue to inspire my research in the years to come, I hope, and I expect. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for wonderful answers um, to the realm of exactly your book and your continuous work. I think a little bit of time and would like to, um, since there are no direct questions now to that um, presentation in exchange, I still want to activate or ask the audience to please use the Q&A button. We are happy to read out your questions. But we also might have time at the very end after we hear the wonderful um, contributions from other authors and respondents to then have maybe a final round of conversation amongst us and with questions. First of all, now, thank you so much, Rosemary and Tammy, for uh, the first book presentation, The Revolt, uh, yeah, Revolts and Cultural Critique. Um, it is wonderful that we started this way already. And I would now like to just move on to our next book, which is um, Quinnen, Kristen Quinnen's um, Hybrid Anxieties. And um, I would like to also say a few words about this part of the session. Also, Christine is a longtime colleague from us here in the Graduate Gender Program and an assistant professor in gender, uh, in gender studies since 2014 at Utrecht University. And uh, the work of Christine is situated at the intersection of queer trans studies, post-colonial studies and critical security studies by now. It's a great pleasure to hear something today of your book, of your first monograph, Hybrid Anxieties, Queering the French Algerian War and its post-colonial legacies, as it is going back to the PhD research at the University of Berkeley, after which you uh, joined us also uh, soon after in, 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 in Utrecht. And so, some of us heard, uh, heard in the past about that research, but then it kind of went away a little bit just to now, you know, come back um, in this wonderful format of this book. And, I'm sh and it's also, you know, I, I, I at least hope I haven't seen it myself in the hand, but what I get from it and we hear more now, um, of course, merging with your more uh, research since then that um, focuses also on borders and security and queer trans studies. It's wonderful, it's a great achievement, Christine, for this book. Congratulations already from my side. After Christine um, has introduced a bit of the book, then it will be um, Alessandra Benedicti Cocken, um, who gives a response or gives some contributions to the, um, to the, um, to, to the book. Uh, also, Alexandra is no stranger to us in the team and um, in the Graduate Gender Program here at Utrecht University. But not only is she a lecturer in our team at Utrecht University, she's also the research coordinator and a senior researcher in the Research Center of Material Culture, RZMC, in Amsterdam, he, uh, here also in the Netherlands. I already know that the two of you, Christine and Alessandra, had some exchanges about the book, and I'm very happy that you can continue for your conversations here or share once more already um, also what you have um, developed amongst you. So without further ado now, I would love to have you start, CQ. Thanks, Katrin. Um, and thanks a lot for organizing this to you and also to Truda and um, Florine for putting this together. It's really, really nice to um, be with you all today and for everyone, with everyone else from around the world that's joining. I um, am supposed to show my book. Um, here it is. Uh, with the, with, it's not really so visible, but um, I also have a PowerPoint that I am going to try to share right now. Hold on one second. Can you all see it now? Yeah, cool, yes. thanks. Okay, so I'll say um, just a few words about my aims uh, with the book. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about the, I'll give you a sort of an outline of the book and then Alessandra will, will probably take some of that up. But I also just wanna, maybe even before that say, just the way that Rosemary, you ended your, um, your uh, presentation is a really nice way for me to pick up, especially the ideas around repair and thinking about contesting binaries. Um, so I hope um, that, you know, I can 
kind of reflect on that a little bit while I'm talking about my book. So here are just some of the points of departure with, with hybrid anxieties. And the book argues that subjectivity and identity were radically interrogated by and through the destructive impacts of the French-Algerian War in uh, the 1950s, 60s, and then I take that up until the 21st century in the book. Um, but I aim to not only expose the violence inherent to this eight-year-long war and the extended post-decolonization period, but to also frame their productive potential to reconfigure memories and relationalities. And to do this, I propose bringing queer theory and post-colonial theory into closer dialogue um, in order to better analyze and, and deconstruct the intertwined nature of identities and also literary and cinematic forms in the wake of the war. So for me, reading post-colonial and queer together allows us to analyze how colonialism was partially sustained through racial and gender categorization and hierar hierarchization. Um, and in this respect, I take queer post-coloniality as sort of a methodological approach, um, as a form of radical critique, and as a deconstructive practice that um, is focused on, on that's focused on the challenging of normative knowledges, identities, behaviors, spatialities, and temporalities, as well as the creation of new modes of social and cultural engagement. Um, the book is also really interested in looking at how the underlying anxieties that flooded the decolonization era and its extended aftermath have been reflected in the consistent undoing of traditional literary and cinematic forms. The text and anal films I analyze cross many, but never quite fit any single category or genre. In this sense, form mirrors content in the texts that in these texts that contend with the fragmentary and fracturing impacts that the war has had and continues to have, have on gender, sexuality, and memory. Um, so I'll just briefly say a little bit about the structure. The first part of the book, uh, which I entitled Masculinity and Memory, um, reveals the deep and long-lasting traumatic violence and exposes the psychic and corporeal fragility felt by many post-war subjects, specifically thinking um, about how masculinity is uh, contested, deconstructed, contested, and reconstructed during and after the war. The first two chapters in this, this section is composed of two chapters. The first in these two chapters approach the themes of masculinity and memory by examining the central place of both physical and symbolic violence in discussions of the French Algerian War. The first chapter I analyze uh, the film Muriel. Um, in, which was uh, made just after the war. And I pair that with a 21st century novel called The Wound. Um, and the second chapter is focuses on, focuses on Michael Haneke's Caché, um, also fairly recent film. Um, and both of these chapters highlight the damaging effects of memories on maintaining a hegemonic and normative French masculinity. French and Algerian masculinity, and also gesture towards alternative modes of masculinity. In the second part of the book, which I titled Queering Postcolonial Legacies, this, I, sh I shift attention to the resistant possibilities that reconfiguring identity holds by analyzing work that eschews linear paths, defined lines, and hetero reproductive futures. Queer modes of agency take center stage to contest and subvert norms surrounding sex and sexuality, which is what I focus on. In on in chapter three, memory and temporality, which is what I focus on in chapter four, and gender and nationality, oops, which is the focus of chapter five. And each of these chapters is anchored by an analysis of uh, a, a novel. Um, and it's this queering, I argue, that opens up new spaces for thinking about the redemptive and productive possibilities of negotiating life in a post-colonial context. And this again is where I hear a lot of resonances with, with Rosemary's work. Um, I'll, I'll stop there just for time's sake and I have other things I could talk about but I'll let Alessandra take over and then we can, we can take the conversation from there. Let's stop sharing my screen. Thanks so much, um, Christine, for this um, introduction. And yes, Alessandra, I'll spotlight you and please you're, you can take it from here. You are still muted. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I timed myself to five minutes, so um, that way. Don't worry, don't get too stressed. Do you wanna maybe do exactly do the presentation mode? Then we'll see the. Yeah, let me go to. Okay, so um, I engage a bit. So first of all, the context of my coming into contact with CQ's book has to do with teaching post-colonial interventions at UCU, thanks to Sandra. Um, and uh, you can still hear me, yeah. And we did a sort of book uh, conversation with the students and then two um, students responded and it went extremely well. And what really hit me and we're hoping to invite CQ to RCMC was how with so much clarity, uh, complex ideas are um, communicated in this book and also staying close to readings of cinematic and uh, literary texts, which I think is such a root of the theoretical that maybe um, my age uh, betrays me was sort of the years of the 90s and early 2000s. So where the literary and the cinematic are theoretical spaces. Um, I've titled the, the response from the wound of the abbess. Okay, so as I said, I was gobsmacked by how incredibly clear yet remaining complex your book was. And it stands firmly among books from Christian Flaw, Mehmet Mack, Jared Hayes, Alexander Wahelier, and the forthcoming work by Adi Salim Barat, which put the colonial into conversation with the body and its sexualizing assemblages, especially in a context of extreme violence to the body. Um, so your fo book's focus then, and I quote you, the context of post-decolonization France and Algeria, this fundamental concern is also at the crux of the relationship between discourses of sex and questions of subjectivity at a critical point provoked by decolonization, a moment when sex, sexuality, desire, and erotic life were indeed renegotiated. And I wonder if they're always being renegotiated and you really bring the, the relevancy of that moment into the present moment in ways I would say like uh, just be at Puar. The modernist Nizan Abim really provoked me the second time I was looking at your book in preparation for today, in that it's undergirded by the question of the wound, where you caringly weave together the implications that inhabit the abim, the abyss, and even the abysmal, demonstrating that they are predicated on an interdependent relationship among victims and perpetrators of colonially informed histories. You refuse to read the hybrid as romantic, which I think is crucial, but rather brings out from the askewed abbess the implications of the violations of a colonial desiring assemblage. Um, and as such, it resonates with and pushes further the work of Mac, Flau, and Hayes, enjoining us subtly, but nonetheless clearly to reread these texts so as to courageously think through what we might consider the relation, not the romanticized erroneous readings of Glissant, but forces to contend caringly with the grim realities that undergird these relations, those we must grapple with to really move forward alongside each other. And I would say, and again, coming back to the close literary and cinematic readings, textual readings, here you, you also come, I am kept being reminded of Asya Jabbar's work, of course, on which you have written, and Tahar Benjaloun's, especially L'Enfant du de Sable. Um, and I don't think it's incidental that your book is being published by the publisher who has translated most of Glissant's novels, which is really where I think the most difficult aspects of opacity are, where it's much more difficult to romanticize his notions of relation. And finally, you're writing things through the cinematic, especially as processes that Eliza Steinbach reminds us correspond to that which cuts and sutures between the visual and the spoken, between frames and between genres, delinking and relinking practices of transfiguration. Um, and I come here to the notion of the wound, which you don't speak about much, but uh, Rosemary also spoke about the wound earlier. Um, within your grounding of sexuality. But I think the wound is constantly there and it's something that I really noticed the second time 
Um, and there's something I think very daring that you do, and I'm hoping to bring it up here and maybe we can talk about it after. Within your grounding of sexuality as products of human activity that are as, and here I'm quoting you, Gail Rubin writes, laden with politics, you invoke the gendered and as such the doing of gender in the sexual, which seems obvious, but I think all of us as scholars constantly shy away from it as much as it's constantly there, and you did not. I bring up perhaps what seems to be on first approach an inappropriate or non-applicable text, that of the Adult Performer Advocacy Committee's Black Lives Matter statement, in which in the same gesture, they paradoxically contribute to, but also subvert the racialized assemblages of how we desire. The wound and the offense always present in the healing. And here I have a, a part of that, that statement. Silence makes us complicit. It is time to say as an industry that Black Lives Matter. This means facing the role our films have in reinforcing racist tropes and racialized fantasies. And I think this idea of racialized fantasies um, as being delved into, and that's what your work does alongside Mac and also Wahelie, is something that many don't really attack straight on. And so I was very grateful for you for doing that. And while you don't really speak much about whiteness studies, this dialogue that you have between texts very much um, in your centering of hypermasculinity is also centering, I would say, mas uh, whiteness studies. That is hybrid anxieties caringly lays bare the anxieties of how we desire across implicit and still under theorized mindscapes, such as colonial, post-colonial, neo-colonial temporalities, the effects of torture and its afterlives. The space that torture takes place in your book um, is huge and, and so important, I think, and putting that into conversation with desire through, sorry, I don't know what happened there, colonial technologies oh, that pay themselves nefariously forward. And so doing, so as long as we desire, our colonial technologies aren't going to change if we don't change how we desire, how we find pleasure, what we find pleasurable. And so doing hybrid anxieties enjoins readers to think of the entanglements of Rothbergian implicatedness. How do such technologies of control scar imprint and stay with both the bodies that undergo the torture, but also those that execute it? The call response structure of your book. So looking for, I put these two books together because you're the, uh, the film and the book because it's examining a similar, the same event yet from different uh, positionalities. The call and response structure of your book forces us to think through hybridity in an aspirational sense as transformative, but also in its least promising expressions as hypermasculinity. And again, you never commit the offense of waxing poetic. The hybridity you reveal is one always of the mise en abime, never letting go of the traumatisms we must as societies contend with. Apologies for the misspelling. And here, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Asya Jabbar's pen name that designates the strength and power Jabbar of the healer, the healer being Asya, but a healer that is always involved in the notion of sor sorrow. Recently, Edgar Garcia invokes the wound, and here I thank scholars Craig E. Stevenson and Neil Martin for reading Garcia's work along with me. That is, the healer cannot completely heal from their wound. They must suffer it enough to remain aware of its implication, but also tend to it sufficiently to assure that their pain not overwhelm those they are trying to heal. If Ashil Mbembe finds a sliver of hope in the politics of enmity, translated as necropolitics um, in the title of his book, in Fanon's role as healer, notably in Algeria, then his gesture hovers constantly in your book's analyses. And here is um, an excerpt from uh, Necropolitics the relation of care. Of the various patients that the Society of Enmity produces, Fanon was concerned in particular with people affected with impotence, raped women, torture victims, those struck with anxiety, stupor, or depression. And I think that for me, although again, you didn't use the word wound or care, the entire way in which you control your own affect in writing and how clear you are offering your reader not a challenge to try to understand what's going on, but make it so lucid, yet hold on to the complexity is such a rare gift to a scholar. So I um, end there. Oh, no, my question, I forgot my question, but I, you know my question, so I will say it. Um, the question is, so I leave you with a question. 
how and if your book's analyses operate trans as a form of healing, since your book rigorously works through translation, transformation, and the transgressive, how do desire, healing, and trans thought relate to each other, if at all? Thanks, Alessandra. That was a really generous and beautiful response that I'm just so incredibly appreciative of. And just, it's been really, just really wonderful for me to also get to work with you and think with you about, about this work. Um, so you brought up so much in, in your response, but maybe I'll just try to grab onto a couple things. First, the, the idea of the wound is, is really interesting for me to think about also. I don't know if this, you thought about it while, while you were reading the book, but I do actually analyze a book called The Wound, um, which in, in chapter one, which I just briefly mentioned in my outline, I pair with, with, a, with a film from um, uh, 1962. Um, and the, the, the novel, The Wound, actually in French, in the original French, was titled Des Hommes Men or Of Men or Some Men. Yeah. But when the English translation, they, they decided to title it The Wound, which I think sort of, you know, interestingly forces us to think about how gender and the wound in, in, in healing are, are maybe um, are, are absolutely connected. Um, that's just sort of an anecdote. Um, but thinking about your question about, about trans, um, I don't so much operationalize trans in the book, although that's absolutely where my work has gone since the book. Um, so I want to think a little bit, I think you mentioned trans, trans, transformative, translational, uh, maybe transnational would be another one, transgender, which comes up mostly in chapter five. Um, and also think a little bit about just, you know, what, what I've been think doing and writing about since then around trans. So I, I think maybe one way to think about this is, is trans the definition that one of the definitions as a surpassing, a transcending and a crossing, which is also for me how queer and how hybridity function in the book. And in this respect, I take a cue from scholars like Aif and Enka and Aranizura who have called for concepts like trans to do more flexible work and to also take trans into anti-identitarian directions, which again is also what I aim to do with queer. So for me in the book, queer and trans function not as fixed um, identity labels, but as conceptual modes of analysis to negotiate critical spaces for self-creation and resistance within existing social structures. So maybe an example of this is, is the fact that a lot of the characters who I, who I analyze in these novels and films fall outside of heteronormative economies of desire, but simply labeling them as gay or lesbian or transgender would, would for me sort of miss the mark. Um, and I think trans can grapple with the transcultural and hybrid experiences of surpassing these limits of hetero and cisgender norms. Um, so I guess in this, in this way, the, um, the queerness and even the transness of, of, the, of the texts is, is again, not about, not always about sexuality or gender, but about forms of relating and becoming Characters diverge from expected pasts. Traditional kinship structures are undone. Normative temporal logics are questioned in different ways of being and doing are cultivated. And again, this is, I think, where I identify the, the sort of redemptive and reparative possibilities. Um, but to maybe bring it back to the, the idea of desire and healing, I think I, I see both trans and desire as moves or movements, as transgressions that can overlap and intersect with other transgressions. And as analytical tools, they create a space of possibility and potential, a space of political uh, and agential potential. And that I, that I think is exactly that, a space of, of healing. Um, so thanks, Alessandra, for kind of getting me to think about those concepts together. I hope it I hope I sort of answered your question.
Thank you, CQ and Alessandro, for this exchange. I feel it is a very nice um, move also the um, you are now what you now said about healing and also um, transformational and repair. And that speaks already very much also to Rosemary's um, presentation. It is nice to see how you work with specific terminology of queer trans as maybe, you know, uh, tools or forces, analytical lenses. And Rosemary works very much with the performative and the arts. Um, it's nice how to see nonetheless how the how the wound or the remembering comes together in these uh, two book presentations already. Wonderful. There is, um, as we, I would say, we should move from here to the third book and rather leave a little bit of time also to digest for all of you here on the screen as panelists to maybe talk to each other still. We also here do not have now the raising hand from the Q&A to throw in a, a real question. So let me move on and still want to say, please, audience, feel free to ask a question to the authors or the books that about the books that you hear about. But it's my great pleasure to come to the third and the final book for today's uh, virtual book launch and to introduce uh, to you Katrine Smith, whose um, wonderful book, Zojourne Truth and Intersectionality, Translating Truths in Feminist Scholarship, wonderful title, um, um, came out also um, just this year in 2021 from Routledge. I could also tell a longer story about the connection that Katrine has with Utrecht University, but let me just say that um, for here that Katrine is an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at Routbau and University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands here. And Katrine's work is situated in feminist philosophy. She moved on, you moved on, I think, from the, the book topic somewhat that also goes back to your PhD project and also, also already from this here, grand graduation that it's out. Um, and uh, you're working right now more on the notion, the question, the quest for the human. But I'm also curious to see maybe to hear how today with how things reverberate between what is in the book, your um, investigation into the reception, the history of reception of Sojourner Truth, very important speech um, in feminist scholarship. After Katrine introduced her book, we will have Vasiliki Bilia Vaso, as we many of us know her, as the respondent to Katrina's book. And it's also, again, a very well chosen match that we have here, that because Katrina's and Vaso's collaborations and friendships have a long, um, a long standing connection already. And you work a lot together. And thus, you know, I'm pretty sure that you have a lot to exchange with each, other, uh, with each other about the book. And thank you, Vaso, for being here. You are, Vaso Beliga is currently a PhD student at Maastricht University, researching into contemporary graphic narratives that engage with the history of feminism and negotiate its meaning in the present. So the question of history, I think also, and how, it, how feminist histories, that is also a binding together of both of your work. You, st um, you have as well and passed at our program in at the Grad Agenda program for some years, not only as a teacher, but also as a research coordinator in one of the big consortium grants in the GRACE project. But now you decided to focus on your PhD, which you successfully uh, got funded for by the, by the Netherlands, Netherlands um, Research Council, the NVO. So, Katrine, Back to you, please show your book and I'm very happy to spotlight you and listen to your presentation. Yes, thank you very much. Here is the book. <laughs> so indeed, um, this book, uh, Sojourner Truth and Intersectionality, Traveling Truths in Feminist Scholarship, it's a revised and reworked version of my PhD dissertation. Um, and I first started the dissertation project, which now culminates in this publication, uh, back in September 2012, um, more than eight years ago, and I find it, well, quite astonishing to realize that. Um, so looking back, I want to share today some academic and personal reflections on my own travels with truth, um, to stay with this uh, wordplay, a serious wordplay that I developed in the research. Because um, I think this project initially emerged from two key interests. The first was an interest in how concepts and ideas travel, how they are taken up in different times and places and geopolitical contexts, and how they shift and transform through those travels. Um, in particular, I was initially very interested with uh, the specific European context of gender and feminist studies. How is it shaped by transatlantic exchange, in dialogue, but also in 
contradistinction to US feminist scholarship. And secondly, um, I was driven by a desire to learn more about feminist theorizing on race and ethnicity, the black feminist tradition and women, women of color feminisms more broadly, to learn from these voices and perspectives that are still um, can be marginalized in our field. Of course, intersectionality has long been a buzzword and today even more so than when I was a student and when I started this project, but how to theorize and practice intersectionality and how to be accountable to histories of exclusion within the feminist tradition and also within the academic field of gender studies. So big questions, but how to tackle them. Um, in the course of my research, in the first years of my research, the idea of focusing on one specific story emerged. Um, so Sojourner Truth, as many of you will already know, was a 19th century abolitionist and feminist speaker who held this very important speech at the Women's Rights Convention in 1851. Um, known by the repeated question, ain't I a woman? Am I not a woman? Um, and in the late 20th century, this story became a key reference point for black feminists and others stressing the importance of thinking about gender, not in isolation, but in its relation to race and other axes of difference. And this story really captured my attention and still does. Uh, because it is at the same time um, simple and complex. It's very well known, it's iconic, but it also contains a lot of um, surprising elements and a lot of underexplored uh, themes within it. So um, in the story of Sojourner Truth and in the um, different ways in which it has been taken up and retold, um, many different intersecting dimensions come to the foreground, notably um, those of gender and race, but also coloniality, class and religion, among others. So by focusing on this one specific story and by tracing how that story has been taken up and retold and how it's been brought into different debates and different contexts, um, that allowed me to um, trace certain developments within intersectional feminist theorizing. So truth in this way becomes my entry point through which to anal analyze and examine this diverse and vibrant field of feminist scholarship. So a red thread that um, then allows to weave together a lot of different intellectual threads. So in the book, I work with um, the story of Sojourner Truth, um, both as a specific historical figure, um, the specific um, historical reference point, but also um, as a traveling uh, story, as a story that, um, yeah, that that changes in 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 this um, in these um, resonances and in the way that it's taken up. So it traces a reception history of this one uh, figure, um, but it also um, aims very much to take up uh, truth as a figure to think with, as an entry point to um, look at and intervene in some contemporary debates. Um, and this research then um, took me into many different and, and unexpected uh, directions. So for instance, uh, truth allowed me to um, delve into feminist epistemologies and knowledge productions. Um, so how dominant truths are challenged and how this truth is known, but also how different understanding of traveling truths, decapitalized and pluralized, um, can be made possible. And she brought me into uh, fields of feminist scholarship that would not have anticipated beforehand, um, such as an engagement with feminist theology, where uh, the story of Sojourner Truth can be read as, a, as an inspirational uh, figure for a different way of relating to religious traditions. And of course, debates uh, around intersectionality, how to theorize and conceptualize intersectionality, which genealogies uh, do we draw on? Um, including what Jennifer Nash uh, has recently called kind of intense intersectionality wars. Um, so as I have kind of uh, followed this uh, trace or this trail of Sojourner Truth in this research, um, she too has accompanied me on my academic and personal uh, journey in these past eight years. Um, as a more junior scholar here um, on this panel, I will uh, um, yeah, once say something about that because when I first embarked on this uh, project eight years ago, I was a fresh out of the research masters um, in gender studies at Utrecht University. And now um, 
this book uh, exists and I am an assistant professor in gender and diversity studies. So I feel very lucky and very privileged to have had this opportunity within this community of the NOG um, to develop myself and to grow um, as an academic. Um, and I found it a very vibrant and, and nurturing surrounding. Um, and next to that, next to this period of personal growth, this past years have also been marked by some difficult challenges and personal losses. Um, and in dealing with what life has thrown at me, I, I've counted myself very lucky to work in an academic tradition, in the feminist tradition, that allows us to see um, links between the personal and the theoretical and to understand uh, vulnerabilities also as a strength and not as a weakness. So I feel very uh, proud and very happy now to um, be here today and to, to have completed the book um, and knowing that I wouldn't have been able to do so without the support of a lot of mentors and peers who have been by my side in, in high and low points and who some of whom are also here today. So I'm very grateful um, to everyone who has accompanied me, accompanied me in some way or other on this journey and these travels with truth, with Sojourner Truth, and I'm very much looking forward to see where this work will travel still. So thank you for that, and thank you for this, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you, Katrine. So nice to hear from you about the journeys with the book and your journeys um, up to here. I would love to um, hear now move to Vaso, and I will also again spotlight you in order to, for you to start your response. Yes, thank you. Um, I have not written it in my response, but I want to say that I am also very proud of Katrine because I happen to know her from the beginning of this. It's exactly, a, a, yeah, from the very moment that she started this project, working on her PhD. Um, and I have been very inspired by her work. Um, so officially my response starts <laughs> now. I would like to start my response with stating my congratulations to Katrine for this brilliant work of scholarship and my admiration for the intellectual and political ambition in this project. So drawing on black feminist epistemology and its emphasis on the located and political nature of knowledge, on Adrienne Rich's politics of location, Donna Haraway's situated technologies, as well as, as, well as uh, on uh, the idea of traveling uh, theories or traveling concepts that uh, have been developed by Edward Said and Mike Ball. Uh, you built an epistemological framework, which you call traveling truths, which emphasizes the located and situated character of knowledge production without losing sight of the ways in which concepts and ideas move across contexts. And you talk not only of geographical contexts, but also of different political and disciplinary contexts. And I find the immensity of the task you set for yourself very impressive, even daunting. You want to do justice to the longer history of Black feminist theorizing about multiple oppressions and interconnectedness in Black women's lives, where intersectionality as a concept and as an analytic disposition has emerged. But you do not want to assume there is one single origin of intersectionality. Rather, you want to show how it can be seen to have multiple origins, to travel in multiple directions and in uh, nonlinear temporalities as well. You want to pay attention to the ways the concept has been employed in different contexts and the different meanings these translations have given it, observing how this travel has taken place within unequal power structures and politics of citation, at the same time, you don't want to assume that, that there are more or less true versions of that meaning. And all this sounds very difficult to achieve, actually. It sounds even contradictory that you can manage to do all these things. But I think you manage it so very well, thanks to your nuanced and generously critical way of thinking, but also because of your choice to anchor your research on this one story and the specific ways it has traveled within specific contexts. So you ask who is taking up Sojourner Truth's story, in what context, for what aim, how does this transfer into a new context take place and which parts of the story are highlighted and which are downplayed in the process? What effects does the retelling of the story have in the debate it is brought into? Um, your work may, makes a very important contribution to the field of feminist historiography as defined by Victoria Brown, uh, a philosophical exercise that takes a step back from the writing of history 
to perform a meta-theoretical reflection on the way feminists construct histories of feminism and the results this has on feminist practice, whether it is intellectual or it is um, activist practice. And uh, in order to do so, you engage with inspiring fluency, feminist scholarship from many different disciplinary um, fields, such as philosophy, history, anthropology, sociology, political science, cultural and literary studies, and theology. At the same time, maintaining your well-established roots within philosophy and a firm grip on the method of close reading. I have found immense enjoyment in reading your book, um, as well as in seeing it develop over the years. And this is not only because of how well built and compelling your arguments are, which they are, but also because of the clarity and pleasantness of your style of writing, which is rare in scholarship that engages such complex and diverse debates. I have two comments uh, slash questions for you. With the first, I will ask you to say uh, something or reflect on uh, an argument you make in the book. And with the second, I will ask you how you take what you've learned from your research and bring it into your work as a teacher, because I have observed you do that as a teacher, because I have worked with you um, in the classroom. My first question is about chapter three, where you show how truth's question, ain't I a woman, has been taken up in debates about woman as a category of analysis and as the subject of feminism. Truth's question, you argue, or the way it has been taken up uh, and passed on to us, makes a double move. On the one hand, it questions racist and class definitions of womanhood, which have historically excluded many women from the category of woman and has made their concerns irrelevant within ma mainstream feminism. On the other hand, the question destabilizes the very notion of woman by showing its ideological character, that it is not a natural category or a given category, but it is always created within certain historical contexts. In this question, you argue, one can find, um, in, in Truth's question, um, what John Scott would call the foundational contradiction within feminism, or what Dennis Riley would call the ambiguousness within feminism, and what you call the productive tension within te feminism. Namely, the fact that feminism both relies on the category woman to make political claims and challenges the category. You identify these two moves, which you call critical affirmation and critical interrogation of the, of the notion of woman in your reading of uh, Black for structuralist and trans feminist engagements with Truth's question. Some of these texts that you read place more emphasis on the affirmation and some place more emphasis on the interrogation of the notion of woman. Now, if I understand it correctly, one of the strongest, the strongest points uh, that you make in your book is that the feminist politics that can be called intersectional ought to be doing both at the same time. And this is a very powerful argument about the importance of intersectionality in feminism. And in my opinion, a moment when I see your own specific approach to what intersectionality means. And I was wondering if you agree with my reading and if you can say more about this, perhaps using an example, especially for those among the audience that have not read your book yet. So that's my first question. The second one, um, is about uh, your practice as a teacher, because you have a lot of uh, students who have no idea about intersectionality, but you also have a lot of students who come into the classroom with a, an idea of what intersectionality means within their, their activist practice and within their, their daily life, and the knowledge that they, they bring from um, other contexts. Um, in your work, you show the immense power that icons and symbols like truth can play in granting feminists to participate in contemporary debates uh, about intersectionality or other debates, both uh, authority and a place from which to speak. I'm wondering now how such icons figure in your work as a teacher. In chapter five, for example, you talk of a significant difference between two icons of intersectionality, Sojourner Truth and Alexandra Kolontai, who was proposed by Nina Like as an alternative example of a European forerunner of intersectionality. You acknowledge the critique directed at Like that her move to place Kolontai in this position is a depoliticizing move that takes attention away from the Black feminist tradition within which intersectionality as a concept emerged. And you inquire 
both into the role of class in the story of Sojourner Truth and the role of race in the ways we configure Kolontai today. But you also ask whether it is useful to see Kolontai as a forerunner of intersectional thought, albeit not a European one, but a transnational uh, one. And if yes, then how it is useful? Um, truth, so true truth, you argue, is a universe, universally acknowledged symbol of intersectionality, not only because of her firm location within a tradition of Black feminist thought and activism, but also because she didn't only um, talk about intersections of different forms of oppression, gender, race, and class, among others, but she embodied them. Kolontai, on the other hand, spoke of intersectional oppressions, but they were not part of her own life. As she came from a wealthy white privileged background, um, and yet, uh, you argue Kolontai might be see as a role model for, for intersectionality. Um, and if this is the case, this is because she dedicated her life to the socialist cause and the workers' struggle rather than choosing bourgeois feminism or mainstream feminism that, that would have been closer to her own location at the time. I'm quoting you, you say, in this move, we might see an act of what the post-colonial uh, scholar Gayatri Spivak has called an unlearning of privilege. Such an unlearning is probably what many of us should be seeking for, but it is also a more demanding and ambivalent process than the identification with a feminist icon who is universally acknowledged. So my question is, how important is a role model for us contemporary feminists? Is it hard or younger people than us? So is it hard not to, it is very hard not to be drawn by the story of Sojourner Truth. There is a, a certain power to it. But when, to identify with truth while occupying a very different intersectional position carries the risk of what Kimberly Crenshaw warns against. Um, assuming one carries the legacy of truth when one, a white woman within feminism, for example, instead should be aware of carrying the legacy of truth's challenge to a feminism that does not take race or class into account. Some scholars you engage with in your book take up Truth's question, and I a woman, as their own question, uh, inheriting her voice. Others instead inheriting her challenge. I'm wondering in your work as a teacher, um, I assume you bring, I have seen you bring uh, Truth's legacy in the classroom. When teaching younger people intersectionality as an analytic, as an analytic disposition and a practice, um, do you bring truth as a role model or as a reminder of a challenge or both, uh, depending on your students' positionality? And I also wonder if for, um, if you bring for your more privileged students who may not embody positions of many intersecting oppressions, um, in order to avoid the impasse of what Gloria Becker would call white innocence or white kids, um, if you bring role models like Kolontai to show how one may learn how to recognize their own complicity within systems of power and, and challenge it. So this is, yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Yeah, mm. Katrina, take over. It was yeah. brilliant. Uh, I think you have a lot to talk with each other. I'm looking forward to your responses. Exactly. Um, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for this um, very rich and very um, interesting uh, questions that you that you pose to me now. Um, I will start maybe with um, with with the last one that you ended on, so we kind of continue that uh, discussion. Um, I definitely found it very interesting um, to work with um, with these iconic stories or with these um, with these symbols also in in feminist teaching. Um, and of course, um, what 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 the book tries to do, and and what I hope uh, feminist pedago pedagogy also uh, would try to do, is um, to really um, take on such an iconic figure. Um, in its complexity, right, and in its contradiction. Um, so this is um, where where Sojourner Truth might um, present itself as um, as a simple story about this intersection of um, the women's suffrage movement and and the abolitionist struggle, feminism, and anti-racism. Um, but then actually, there's so much more uh, within this one story and within this uh, within this figure. Um, so I think this is a very um, 
both um, both telling these feminist stories and reflecting on how those stories are being told and what happens in in that telling. And there, I've been um, as 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 you too um, quite inspired by the work of Claire Hemmings um, on this political grammar of of feminist uh, theory. Right? Um, what is at stake in how we narrate um, the the history of feminism? And therefore, I would say that indeed it's it's it is it's about kind of um, keeping keeping those two sides uh, in mind. Um, and it's interesting that you brought now to the foreground indeed this this juxtaposition with um, with the figure of truth and and the figure of Kolontai, um, and which one is a more um, easy figure to relate to and, and why. So I, I, I think the passage that you, um, that you referenced to is kind of a bit of a provocation on my side to say, um, um, to, to indeed think about, um, to think about um, Kolontai as, as also a, a, a figure that, that can teach us something in this, um, in this way in which, uh, she yeah builds these solidarities or she she um unlearns uh, this privilege um so yeah i i um i find this um i find this interesting and i find it also indeed um what you highlighted um how do we relate to these stories um how do we relate to these uncomfortable histories um inheriting uh, truth challenge. What does it mean? Uh, what does it mean for us? Uh, what does it mean for us today um, in the Netherlands? In um, in yeah in the contemporary um, feminist discourse. How can we how can we um, relate to this complex and contradictory narratives? Um, and maybe there it bring it to to the first question that you that you brought uh, forward um about this double move or about um affirming and uh, interrogating um that how can we hold uh, those two at the same time i think that is a very different difficult task or it is a very difficult challenge um but indeed uh, very necessary so i found your your suggestion that this is um that this may be key to, to how I understand um, an intersectional feminist um, approach, um, an interesting one that I'll have to think about more because, um, because that chapter is, um, is the last one that I wrote um, for the book, um, but maybe indeed something there comes to the foreground that um, that's maybe implicitly uh, more implicitly present in 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 other parts, um, but I really have to think about that. Um, I yeah, I really have to think about that more. Well. So thank you so much uh, for these thoughts. I think I'll leave it here. I, to respond, of course, you have to think about it more because your work was really to map all these debates about intersectionality and not to really take a position yourself about what makes good intersectional practice or scholarship. But I just thought, I think it shines through in that in that moment, in that chapter. As the, uh, but maybe this is me reading it as this yeah. is the... Yeah, I find this, I find this, I find this... Um, I, I, yeah. Probably, I want to, <laughs> I would like to say yes, that's what's happening there. <laughs> Wonderful. It's, as Rosemary started uh, uh, responding with its, um, you know, meet the reader is often a very, you know, um, rich and uh, fruitful experience and time flies here. And I am already at the moment of thinking we have to slowly um, round off. But I first of all would like to also once more thank um, Vaso um, responding to Katrina and your response is very rich and thoughtful, really th seeing you thinking about the work where, where you can still take it in what kind of different um, journeys it could, it could, it could lead into. Um, my question is really now to the panelists who might want to all um, switch on their cameras once more. 
to if we want to have one round of conversation amongst us or if we think it was beautiful to get these pitches and this idea and you know now we leave with that i don't want to just um take the take charge and say like we have to round off looking at the time the time has come but um it is um it is a possibility if one of you would like to say something still to the others of your co-authors in this book launch session please take it on i would like to at least give you the the, the moment. Does anyone want to say something still? I don't think we have time for more questions, but I see that some questions were raised and they were answered in the in the in the Q and A button themselves. Thank you very much for posting questions, dear audience. If we all are saturated and inspired, and really, I want to motivate everybody to read and get the books. Um, we spoke a lot about Utrecht University. All of these books are in ebook quality available in our library. So whoever has access to our university library for sure can read it already, but then it's also nice to buy sometimes books. So I really wanna say, this is the moment, these are the authors to do so. I would love to have more time chatting and discussing further the very nicely speaking together um, scholarship that was presented today. I would love to, I would like to very much thank the respondents for taking the time for reading or rereading the books. And I would like to very much thank the authors for their um, wonderful interventions into the field of feminist studies, uh, gender and diversity studies, the arts, queer and trans studies and post-colonial studies. Thank you. I, ha I do not know how best to end a online event. Normally we would clap and uh, that is, uh, would be very much needed. And we also can do this for a moment, but I hope that you all enjoyed that event. We hope to continue this. This was the start. Maybe there are more virtual book launches to come in our Netherlands Research School of Gender Studies. It was great fun to do that for organizing this. So thank you all and hope to see you all soon in real life anywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, for organizing yeah. and thanks everybody for the brilliant thoughts. A lot to think about.